All right, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools, part of our esports mini series that uh, we wanted to start with just you know three or four episodes. And Trisha, this thing has just really gone deep. Uh, for us as we continue to be able to reach out to researchers. And I think one of the thing that is really just fascinating to me is how many people in the esports industry in all aspects of esports are willing to come on and talk and the passion that they bring. And that is the same with today's guest. That's right. You know, I, I think I have even been guilty of, I think, discounting how influential gaming is like in yeah. society and the more conversations that we are having as part of this series uh, the more i am convinced that video games need to be an important part of our classroom conversations of our family conversations as well um, and today's guest reminds us that they need to be a part of our conversations like government nationwide, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. Today we have on Dr. Leon Shao, who is a PhD fellow at the IT University of Copenhagen. He also holds visiting appointments at Stanford Law School and the University of York's Computer Science Department. Leon researches video game law, particularly the regulation of loot boxes. We are going to include links so that you can learn more about Dr. Shao and his research, which has been featured by The Guardian, The New York Times, NPR, just to name a few. Um, so again, if like me, you never thought about what law might have to do with games, uh, I think this conversation is maybe just going to open up your mind a little bit again to when we're talking to students about future career pathways, like what are some of the intersections that we're not even aware of? I don't know. Yeah. And I think that's part of our hope with this mini series is if you are a non-gamer like I am, and I was still in a fourth grade classroom today, I would not be understanding the culture of my students, right? One of the things I talk about a lot when I'm consulting is how are we inviting today's, how are we inviting the culture of kids into our classrooms? And if you're a non-gamer, like I am, like in what I'm learning through this mini series, I had no idea. I thought gamers just sat in front of TVs and played games. And now we're talking to a lawyer and a researcher around game, the, the amount of the, how big the industry is and all the different avenues. If again, if I was a fourth grade teacher, I'd be starting to think through this mini series of, okay, I have a kid who's interested in video games. Instead of shutting that down or having these negative conversations about playing video games, if that is a passion a kid has, how do we start helping them understand there's an intersection between video games and law? There's an intersection between video games and running companies. There's an intersection between video games and TV production, aka Twitch. And today, I think that to me is the big question uh, and just the idea to be thinking about as you're hearing uh, the uh, today's interview is just how do we support kids today in creating intersections between their passions? And our goal with this esports series is that is to understand more about esports, understand more about video games. And then instead of shutting kids down, is there a way that we can start saying, Hey, I listened to this podcast. You know, if you're really into video games and ethics, there's a career path for you there in being a video game lawyer. I just, I never thought about this, you know, and he even goes into a little bit about esports around if you're setting up an esports program, what are the rules that everybody's following? Is everybody playing with the same kits? And I, I just, you know, me and my baseball brain, which most people know already, I, I think about it. Yeah. How different would it be if my Seattle Mariners show up with wood bats and, you know, the Toronto Blue Jays show up with metal bats. That's not a fair, yeah. that's not a fair game. So there's some agreements behind and that takes somebody that takes somebody who understands how to negotiate. That takes somebody to understand how to set up rules and policies behind what those rules are. I just think there's so much into this. Well, and I think and so as you're listening to this, just be thinking about what's the intersection of passions that maybe you have in your classroom. Uh, you know, and, and if you teach ethics, you know, sometimes I feel like the way that we frame ethics and the teaching of it, you know, it's like this moral dilemma of the situation that's not going to happen. Right. And I disengage from that, that conversation, right? It's sort of like the math problem. That's like, Jimmy wants to buy 203 watermelons. Like nobody buys that many watermelons. So again, I think yeah. almost immediately people disengage from that. But what Dr. Shaw is reminding us is if you teach ethics, 
take a look at a video game, right? Take a look at a mobile game and invite students to look at the design of that game as a text type. So um, again, I'm just thinking for any of our ELA lit teachers out there, these are also really interesting texts to uh, to bring some analysis to and some critical mm. thinking to. Um, so I, I really hope that folks enjoy this conversation. Jeff, I just, I really like how each episode of this series is expanding how I am seeing the world of esports and gaming. And I hope that's the experience for listeners too. And with that, here is Dr. Leon Shao, a PhD fellow at the IT in University of Copenhagen. He also has appointments at Stanford Law School and the University of York's Computer Science. He's a great interview all the way from Copenhagen, spending some time with us today. I hope you enjoy this one. And with that, on with the show. All right. I am so excited for this interview today with Leon, uh, just this intersection between law and gaming and something that I didn't even know existed in the world. You know, you love it when you find Trisha, you just find these things, you find people doing jobs where you're like, I didn't even know that was a job. Uh, and that's what today is all about. So Leon, welcome to, to the podcast. And we're going to jump right in here. Uh, you've been named a top 30 under 30 for Forbes uh, Europe. And they've recognized the contributions you were making around the world of gaming law and policy. We're doing this whole mini series here on esports and taking a very broad view at the world of video games, specifically as it relates to, to K-12 education and some of the things we need to be thinking about. As you kind of look at the intersection of gaming and law, how did you even think about there might be something here to look at law and, and video games and kind of merge your, your, your two passions? How, how did you even get to that point? that spot. Uh, sure. Uh, I, you know, I am a video game player and then I went to law school and I think <laughs> when that happens and it happens to a lot of people now because so many play uh, people play video games nowadays. And I think to many of us, it just so happens that, Oh yeah, there are some legal issues relating yeah. to the, uh, the hobby that we are engaging in. Are there any interesting things that we want to look at? And I started all of this research uh, when I went on exchange to uh, Singapore uh, to look at technology law. And I, I was uh, basically asked to do a research project on something. And I was like, I, I should look about uh, <laughs> these gambling-like things in video games, shouldn't I? And uh, that's how it all started. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's and that's great. it's so interesting because, you know, governments listen to the research that you're doing. You know, the industry also is looking to be more accountable um, and again, like Jeff said, this intersection of law and gaming, we didn't even really think about that perspective. And then as I was researching more about the work that you do, of course, you're not alone in this field. There are many other people who are also doing this. Um, and that pointed me to the work that you're doing for the upcoming January Ethical Games Conference. And listeners will put the link to that in the show notes because um, that's sort of an interesting thing. And you are a paper chair for that coming conference um, for a teacher or a student who might, you know, be really passionate about ethics, but not aware of how games and ethics merge, I'm wondering if you can give us um, an example of a conversation where the two come together or, or maybe even speak to what you think is going to come up in the scope of that January conference. Sure. Um, I, I think what's really interesting about this particular conference is that it's not just about academia, because most conferences, most academic conferences, they're just about academia. And you end up having lots of professors, uh, some uh, more junior uh, academic researchers talking to each other without involving the industry. What is cool about this one is that the industry is being asked to be part of this because uh, I, I think uh, the wish is that the uh, contributions that will be made at this conference will be something that is practicable, uh, that could be used by the industry. So I think that's the really interesting thing. And to your question about what kind of uh, topics might come up, um, I, I think perhaps to me, uh, because of my research area, and I think if you ask the other people uh, who are part of this, uh, they will probably give you very different answers. But to me, uh, the main thing is, I, I think we know now that there are potential harms uh, to video games, uh, but that doesn't mean that people should just not play video games at all there are also very many benefits to video games. How do we balance those things to make sure that uh, people can benefit from uh, all the good things about video games, but 
at the same time also stay safe from the potential harms. For example, we know that uh, in some video games, you can spend a lot of time or a lot of money. Uh, are there ways that companies can put in something to make sure uh, the players don't spend that much time or don't spend that much money? Uh, for example, I, I know uh, some of the games have implemented a sort of uh, a notice that will pop up um, once you've played for a certain length of time, or they start to reduce the rewards that you can get by playing to discourage you from playing too long during a one single day, for example. Another interesting thing might be that, uh, uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, in quite a lot of video games, uh, a few players spend a lot of money, whilst other players, a lot of other players, are playing that game for free. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this is a really interesting question because um, it is arguable that some of those players who are spending a lot of money are potentially being harmed, uh, but we don't know that for sure. However, at the same time, you are uh, allowing a lot of other players uh, some of whom might be from uh, countries that are less privileged, who might not be able to afford a full uh, console game or a, a, a full software purchase. Uh, but now they can play a very good game with a very nice graphics, good gameplay for free. Uh, there are definitely ethical issues relating to that. Uh, should you be that free-to-play player? Um, uh, should a company uh, perhaps restrict how much a player can spend uh, uh, maximum uh, to ensure that they're not uh, being harmed? Lots of different uh, issues. And I, I've definitely uh, uh, been rather preoccupied in my answer about just spending and uh, t time and money. But if you ask someone else, I'm sure there are other answers to that question. That's a, that's a really interesting kind of idea. Have you have you done any research around even like minors or students, those under the age of 18? Are they spending money? Do we see them just playing the free version? Uh, kind of talk about where's where's this, how does this apply to even say collegiate level? Because I know that, that we have a lot of universities now um, that are joining e-sports, e you know, communities. How do some of these ethics maybe play into, you know, our K-12 schools and even our collegiate level uh, e-sports programs? I'm sure. Uh, definitely, there, there have been research done by others, like you've mentioned, who've looked at uh, people who are younger, who are uh, not adults. Uh, and I, I, I think we did see that uh, uh, children uh, who would uh, purchase loot boxes tended to, after becoming an adult, uh, engage more often in uh, mm. traditional gambling and spend more money on traditional gambling. This doesn't mean that uh, necessarily that people who purchase loot boxes uh, went on to uh, gamble because of loot boxes. It could right. just be uh, that uh, people who are more impulsive would just want to engage in both activities. But uh, it, it does seem, uh, there, there does seem to be some similarities between the two products. But about esports, because that's uh, a sort of the, uh, the, the central theme here. I think one interesting thing is, in some video games, some esports games, you can pay money to basically be more competitive, to be mm. stronger. And I think that's a very interesting uh, ethical issue because should that be allowed as a sport? Mm. Uh, because I think with traditional sports, there tends not to be a, a, a thing where uh, if you can buy better equipment, you're faster. Um, yeah. I don't think we would allow that. We will say, okay, you have to use the same equipment. Uh, yeah. because we want everyone to compete on equal footing. But in some of the esports games, you can buy to be stronger. Um, and of, of course, there are uh, uh, concerns about that. Mm. I actually came across, and forgive me for forgetting where you shared this, it was in one of your many, many, many interviews um, that you talked about some of these like in-app or in-app purchases that are kind of, Jeff, to your question, like very manipulative for a younger player. So it was the idea that, you know, if I'm like eight or nine years old, I'm playing this game. And then there's this like really adorable teddy bear that says, hey, I need your help. Spend five credits and save me. Um, and, you know, you're also sort of pointing out like, that's a really not great thing to be doing to a young child. And it's really interesting because I had never thought about in-app purchases in that way before. And it made me wonder, you know, how many parents or caretakers that, you know, their, their children might be playing some of these games, have they played the game through just to sort of check for that before? And how important that is that as adults, I think playing games that children are playing, that maybe teens that we teach are playing, it's a really great way for us to also a, I think, take an interest in what they're interested in, but also see, like, 
what is some of the messaging? And I'm wondering when you were doing the research to come across that, like how many games do you have to engage with? Um, you know, or do you sort of, um, do, do, are you looking at different genres of games more closely? Um, yeah, I, I, I think in terms of uh, perhaps not genres, but more uh, the platforms, I've uh, mostly focused on the mobile platform uh, mm. because I think that's where uh, you would mostly find games uh, that are free to download. Uh, yeah. But then once you are inside the game, uh, once you are a little invested into the game, uh, you start having to spend money as compared to, I think, console games, which uh, tend to be the ones where you've already spent quite a lot uh, a large amount of money buying it. Uh, there's still games, console games, that then still ask you to buy more stuff uh, inside the game. But ten, they tend to be less aggressive with their monetization, I think. Uh, but so mostly uh, focus on mobile games. But w w for the uh, bigger studies that I do, it, 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 it does involve playing through, say, a hundred mobile games, uh, wow. many of which I am not particularly interested in. Uh, <laughs> match three games, uh, yeah. the ones where you have to match up. Uh, the little objects so that they, they would then blow up. Uh, I think I'm getting quite good at that. I, I started out being very bad at that game, <laughs> that type of game. Uh, but now I, I think I'm getting quite good. Like uh, pretty much do it without really looking at it now. Um, yeah, uh, but but I, I I think you're right about uh, parents uh, playing the games. I think that is very important because we found that there are a lot of information about video games that are not available through a Google search. Uh, the, the company doesn't put it onto their website. They will just put it inside the game. Mm. And uh, I, I think for some of the less popular games, perhaps, uh, there wouldn't be another player who decide to put that information onto a forum so that you can Google search it. So playing the game is really important. And also uh, talk uh, to uh, the young people around you uh, for sure. Because I think, at least to me, uh, with some of the things that I found, I don't think it would affect me uh, as an adult, uh, not, not a very old adult, just an, as a young sure. adult. I don't think it really affects me, but I, I think it possibly is just intended to affect a, a young person. But of course, we need to do, uh, do more research on that. Well, and I'm wondering, you know, you've been doing this research for a while. Is your sense with mobile games that they are getting, are they getting more ethical? Are they getting less ethical? Or do you feel like it's sort of staying the same or is that an impossible question for me to ask of you? Um, I, I, I suppose we haven't really checked uh, mm. whether companies have gotten better. Um, that, that, that would be a very interesting question uh, to look at. But I think perhaps with the bigger companies, the uh, more famous ones that really have a reputation that they want to uphold, I think they are doing better mm. uh, or at least they are uh, more widely promoting that they are supposedly doing better. I don't know whether the things that they've implemented necessarily means that the game is safer, but they do uh, seem to have done more things. And I suppose uh, the most obvious thing would be that we have seen quite a few companies uh, remove blue boxes uh, or gambling-like uh, mechanics from their games. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a plus. But I think... Uh, especially on the mobile platform where uh, even smaller companies uh, from uh, non-Western countries are able to uh, have a good market share. I, I think for those companies, uh, they don't necessarily have uh, thought through uh, some of the considerations. And uh, Sorry, what? Jeff, I'm going to jump in and steal one last Keep question. Going, and I promise I'll be there. quiet. <laughs> and then I promise I'll be quiet. I'm just, you know, I again, I think the idea for students to understand that research it can, again, help, you know, hold different companies and entities to be more accountable is a really great thing for them to learn because, you know, Jeff, you and I talk all the time about getting good at research. There's real world impact there. I'm wondering if you can explain that shift. How does that happen? As a researcher, are you bringing that to a corporate entity? Is it you're speaking directly to a government and then they're applying the pressure? Like, what does that process actually look like? It's really interesting that, that you mentioned, uh, you know, engaging with the companies directly and engaging with governments, because I think neither of those would be the, the, the really effective way. Both are not, like, I, I think both sound like they would work, but yeah. the problem with the companies is usually you can't reach them uh, or they might actually uh, sort of show that, oh, we want, we want to hear about this. Uh, and then they don't get back to you or... <laughs> 
or they listen to you and, and then they do nothing. Um, so I don't think directly engaging with companies, at least from my experience, have really worked out. Um, and engaging with governments, the problem with that is um, it is effective. Uh, if you are able to convince the government to adopt a new policy, that is going to uh, cause change. Absolutely. But that process is so lengthy, so prolonged. that so um, slow, yeah. It's so slow. So it, say you, you have a research finding, I think it'll be five years, maybe yeah. even 10 uh, before you can see it being put into practice. And uh, and I, I think perhaps in the last few years, we've had more uh, bigger issues yeah. you know, to be worried about uh, than, than video games. So it hasn't really been on the agenda. But what I, I think is really important is actually the public communication part and mm. engaging with the media, like speaking with you guys, speaking with the, uh, the, the video game industry media in particular, I think, uh, because uh, I, I think for the policy impact, where, when, when I, I think I, my research got companies to change the way they act, it's not because I published the paper, it's because a, a journalist, very good one, picked up on the findings and then it got promoted and then people actually read it. Uh, and then players were all realizing, oh, this is a problem. And I think only then did the companies comply. Not because I did. Well, I, I suppose it's because I did the study as the first thing. But if I just did the study and didn't really communicate it and or, or, or didn't really very fortunately uh, had the story picked up, I don't think it would have had the impact that he did. That makes a lot of sense because Jeff and I have interviewed a number of science communicators who, as you you know, were alluding to some of the bigger problems, you know, helping people understand kind of the scope of gigantic issues. There is the research, but then there's making sure that it's accessible to the public. So I think that's a great message for teachers and students to take away is what's the research component that, you know, again, seems like, okay, this has gone through a really robust process and kind of bringing the data together. That's one thing. But then how do I get people to care about this and understand maybe what the stakes are in a way that, I don't know, like it's dinner table conversation, maybe like what is the soundbite from the NPR story that you've done that folks are going to actually be able to explain to one another? Thanks for kind of explaining that piece. And Jeff, now my questioning is over. I'm sorry that I stole so many. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I was just wondering, you know, you do a lot, you know, globally. Are you finding that right now, where we are right now, are there some big themes that are emerging uh, when you're kind of doing this research? You're going to conferences. Are there kind of some big themes around gaming that you think there is starting to have this conversation around and we're starting to look more closely at? Do you see any themes kind of emerging at the moment? It's it's quite interesting uh, because I, I I think for me maybe it's because I, I I'm quite a digital person but I've never really felt sort of the national borders and I feel mm. like um, perhaps just my uh, rather small research field uh, even though it's been quite international I think we've just been talking talking to each other uh, remotely sending emails so I, I don't think we've really been uh, sort of in our own bubble it's sure. a good thing that that, that we manage that. Um, as to uh, any themes that are emerging, um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, what, what, what kind of themes uh, do you mean? Well, just around, I think around this idea of, you know, you talked a little bit about gambling uh, and maybe there is a, maybe or maybe not, there's a correlation there. We're not sure, but you're just, you know, you're starting to dig into this. Are there any things that we're just seeing of people are starting to take notice on a global scale? You know, some of your research coming out that you're just hearing more conversations around, like the stuff you've done at the Times, the, you know, the NR, uh, NPR. Uh, are we just, are you just hearing, hearing some things out there or, or what is the conversation right now? I, I suppose with uh, uh, video game monetization uh, as a thing, I, I think loot boxes sort of has been the big the issue. Big okay. Uh, I, I think like quite a lot of uh, countries have already looked at it. I, I, I think they've, uh, decided uh, whether they're going to do something or they've decided they're not going to do something. I feel like that issue is perhaps uh, a big one right now. Uh, but I, I guess what's emerging is uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about the new ways the games are being monetized. You, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we've seen some games remove their loot boxes, but that doesn't mean that this game just decided it doesn't want to make money anymore. Right. <laughs> actually implemented a new way of making money. And uh, that new way is called a season pass or a battle pass mm. where uh, you spend a little bit of money to sort of buy like a membership for a month or uh, two or three months, but then you don't get all the rewards 
just by buying the membership. You actually have to keep playing the game mm. to sort of uh, get levels. And only if you play a, a rather lengthy amount of time for each of those games do you get all the rewards that you want. And this seems potentially a little problematic because the player spend money, uh, but they're not going to be able to get everything they want unless they also then invest more time. And the game is not really very upfront about exactly how much time you need to spend. Mm. Uh, and the player might felt, uh, may, they might feel like, I've already spent this amount of money. I've already bought the things. So I better keep playing so that I get all the things that I already bought. Uh, th- things like that. Yeah. I would like to wrap this up by you just kind of maybe going back to your K-12 days and some of the things like in school, you know, you, you said you were a video gamer. Were you playing video games in, in middle school, high school? And, and kind of like, what was your journey? Even if you can go back that far and just kind of reflect on things that were happening in your middle school, high school days sure. around playing games. And then you get to university and you're like, hey, there might be something here. Can you maybe just talk about that for a sec? Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I, I have a rather unique experience, I, I, I think, uh, in that um, my parents are very encouraging of uh, video game related things. I, I know other parents are probably a lot more negative about it. I, I, I realize that throughout this podcast, I, I've painted video games in a rather negative picture. Uh, but, uh, but that's just because of some of the monetization things. I think as an activity, uh, my parents encouraged me to do it. Uh, they didn't really... Uh, try to restrict me. Uh, and, and I think uh, that also made me think quite positively about this activity. Um, and, and, and yeah, and I think increasingly, you know, this is a very big industry. Uh, and there are many different jobs available in this industry. Um, you know, uh, you know uh, I think for me, maybe it's on the legal side, uh, uh, you know, in addition to just doing academic research on uh, video games uh, or video game law. Uh, you can also be, say, an in-house counsel at a video game company. Mm. Uh, that would also be very interesting. But there are many job opportunities. Um, so yeah, yeah, de- definitely look at video games as an opportunity rather than a negative thing to avoid uh, as a young person or as someone uh, uh, interacting with a young person. I think. Patricia, I'm going to think about it the next time. And I hate to admit this on the podcast, but you know, sometimes I've been watching Netflix for so long that it pops up the thing, the the little screen that says, are you still watching? And as we're talking to Leon, I can see that now in a video games, you know, you've been playing video games for five hours and all of a sudden it's like, do you really still want to play? You know, just to give you that pause of, Oh, well, how long have I been sitting here? Cause sometimes you don't realize, you know, you're binge watching your favorite show and you don't realize it's been five hours and you didn't accomplish anything today, uh, because you've just been watching TV. So I love even you talking about some of those crossovers that we're seeing regardless of media, whether that media is video games, whether that media is, is now binge watching, which is, a, it, which is an issue as well, whether whatever pick your platform. Um, it's just interesting to start seeing some of those those overlays uh, on that as well. Well, yeah. Yeah, And, you know, I'm thinking about it too. You know, I just recently was on a flight and noticing, you know, I had somebody that was sitting sort of like diagonally for me. So I could see it was a Tetris like game and he must've played it for like five hours straight. I was (laughs) on one hand kind of impressed. um, But I like that you're sort of, you know, inviting us to have these conversations about our media use just from a practical standpoint As a researcher who, again, you're researching games, you mentioned, you know, like the huge number of mobile games that you play. Can you speak to teachers in terms of like what your workflow is like? How do you document the research that you're doing while you're experiencing gameplay? Um, You know, I'm thinking like, how do you even timestamp a moment in a game that you want to return to? So like, what does your notes look like? (laughs) Yeah, um, I, I, I think the, the most helpful feature is actually to just take screenshots. Okay. Um, I, I, I think for me, because I, 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 I know, I, I think for researchers who, uh, play video games to sort of look at, uh, how it has been narrated and how the storytelling has been or how the character has developed. I, I think for those researchers, it will be a more difficult. They'll probably, uh, take proper notes. Uh, but for me, I, I'm just, playing a, a game, uh, a, a great volume of game, but for each game, not for very long, just to find a very specific thing. So for me, it, it's usually just start playing the game, uh, go as far as I need to find that product. That I need to a uh, screenshot, take the screenshot, and I'm done. Uh, but but I, I realize that that's probably uh, quite unique. 
<laughs> and I think you know, Jeff, what you said about different um, media uh, mediums. I, I think even uh, on social media, we're increasingly seeing uh, these measures being implemented to try to interrupt you, uh, to try to remind you. I, I think mm. on Instagram, I've seen uh, this pop up where if you scroll down far enough, it will tell you you've actually already seen all of these content. Are you sure you're still? Yeah. <laughs> them up and then I, I i've heard that others have encountered on tiktok a, a, a thing where uh it will remind you that um mm. that it's been a while since you've started watching these things so mm. oh gosh i feel almost like proud of myself that i've never never, never come across that, that in yeah. tiktok so it's, it means maybe i haven't used too much of it but um that's great and i you know i've i've seen tech ethicists even debate some of the buttons that are available with social media like if it wasn't a heart button um but it was sort of like I have a question about this or, you know, like where is the friction almost that we can add in some of that design that might, again, just make us a little more aware of our consumption. So I think that's a really cool challenge for teachers and students to be looking at their gameplay, looking at really media consumption, our media diets. Is there enough friction? Is there no friction at all? And what might the designer of that game or that platform or that app do just to like slow us down a little bit? Um, I think that would make for such a great class conversation. Yeah, I even love the idea of just looking at games or having kids bring in games that they might be playing and have conversations. You know, we can go, just go back to loot boxes have conversations of why is the loot box there right now? It just all of a sudden you've gotten to this point in the game. And now they're asking you, you know, they don't usually ask you in the first part of the game. They wait till they got you into it. Uh, and then now they're asking you to spend the money or upgrade your armor or whatever it happens to be. Uh, just even, I think, having conversations with students like what what are they thinking that it's at this point in the game that they start asking for money? You know, and what happens after that? You know, if you don't spend the money, all of a sudden you're at a disadvantage which now makes you want to go back and spend the money. So you have the advantage, you know, and it's just this psychological gameplay that, that they're, they're getting you into to, to make you buy uh, to, you know, to click on the loot box. So I think just those conversations, even just having those conversations with kiddos in class, I think are, is just a, a great way to start just thinking about the ideas. Right. So, well, Leon, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and I know time, uh, I can see the clock behind you. It looks like it's 7 p.m. wherever you are. Uh, so appreciate you, you staying up and being on this with us. Uh, we will have links to your Twitter and your website. Is there any other links or places that people could reach out to you uh, to learn more about your research or, or places that they can connect? No, I, I think they should be able to uh, fi find me on, on those places. I also have uh, accounts on the other platforms. So I don't really use them. Okay. Uh, so those would be good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it. And thanks for your insight. Yeah. Thanks for uh, inviting me.